Hello, everybody. Welcome. We're going to give it just another minute, see if more people would be joining us. Just some housekeeping items. Please keep your uh, device on mute yes. so that we can yes. the presenter. And, and, and if you have any questions, you can put them in the chat. And then she'll also have time at the end for questions. All right, we'll go ahead and get started. Hello, my name is Jana Weiss. I'm the student lab coordinator at Coleman College. I am so happy to be here with you today in another Recipes for Success, where we have teamed up with the Academic Success Center, also known as tutoring, and with counseling. Today we have with us Brandy Lerman, who is the Coleman counselor, and she was going to be talking about the balancing act and and how to just get everything done in the short amount of time that we have. Please welcome Brandy Lerman. Hi, everyone. Thanks for spending some time with me this morning. This is fun stuff. I love getting to do this. So um, without further ado, we're going to jump in. Um, time is always a relationship that folks have such an interesting relationship with. And so I wanted to do a little bit on time specifically, how we manage it, how we use it, um, how we think about it um, so that we can get the most out of it. So the first thing I wanna jump into that I find a lot of folks have challenged with is saying no. Um, and so many, many folks just don't like saying no. They feel like they're gonna let someone down or disappoint someone. Um, they get asked to spend time or to do something for someone and saying no kind of feels like it's a communication that I don't care about that person who's asking for me to do this thing or spend this time with them. And what I want to dispel is this notion that you have to say yes. Well, you don't. Um, but again, we don't want to give into giving away our time, but we also don't have to say no. So there's a different script that I want to share with you and give you a different way to think about time, specifically your time and what it's for. So many of us are very familiar with guilt trips. My own mother is a travel agent for guilt trips. So I get sent on many of them very frequently. So I've had a lot of opportunity to kind of get proficient at using this kind of a script and to really think about what is my time for? Well, as a student, your time is for reading chapters and books, studying, um, maybe doing an outline for a chapter or an article, um, writing a care plan, which many of you in health sciences would do finishing a paper, um, organizing note cards if we're doing vocabulary, studying for tests constantly, practicing for skill sets and um, skills-based checkoffs, things like that, reviewing a study guide, writing medication cards, all sorts of things, right? Scheduling study groups. And that's just your student role, right? Many of you are employees, many of you are parents, and we haven't even gotten to those other roles yet and all of the things that come with those roles. So just as a student, this is like kind of scratching the tip of the iceberg of all of the things that you have to do as a student. So when you're considering this ask for your time or your bandwidth, I want you to think about a different kind of script, right? Try and pull yourself out of the yes and no dichotomy because that's what a lot of folks try and pin us into is putting that round hole, that square peg into a round hole. And what I want to encourage is getting a bigger perspective on how to answer that question. It doesn't just come down to yes or no. You wanna be able to acknowledge that a person has asked for your time, right? Cool, so if I do X for you, or if I go to Y with you, then are you going to help me get my time back? Okay, well, how are you gonna help me get my time back? Are you going to read a chapter, do an outline? write a care plan, write a paper, organize note cards, study for a test, review a study guide, do medication cards for me, organize a study group, or talk to my group members, or talk to my peers, or write this email I've got to write to my faculty, or show up for a clinic. Do you think it's likely they're going to do that? Probably not. And when you ask the question back to them, they're probably going to say no, right? You're the one paying to be tortured as a student, right? Being a student is not necessarily fun. It's a lot of work. So if a person's not paying to get the education, their name's not going on the diploma, they're probably not gonna opt in 
So they're probably going to say no. Now, when we sit back and think about that, the way we've used the script, right? Well, if I do this for you, if I go to this place with you, how are you going to help me get my time back? Are you going to do any of these things on the list? No? Okay, well, then I'll see you after finals, right? And this whole perception and the shift of, I hate saying no. Well, that's great. Use the script, right? If I go do this, if I go here with you, if I do this for you, if I spend this time with you, how are you going to help me get my time back? Are you going to do certain things for me, right? Are you going to take the kids? Are you going to take them to school? Are you going to bathe them at night and feed them? Are you going to go grocery shopping for me? Are you going to clean things around the house for me, right? And these kind of touch on other roles we play in life, not just as a student. So we think of lots of things that we have to be responsible for. And instead of saying yes, but, or no, but, we're doing yes and, right? I hear that you want me to spend time with you. If I do that, how are you gonna help me get my time back? So we start using that script. We no longer are responsible for saying no. So if we don't like saying no, don't be the one to say it, put it on somebody else, put it on anyone else. And if you do this consistently, People who ask for your time generally are going to get the picture over time. Oh, well, I know so-and-so is just going to ask me if I'm going to do their schoolwork for them. And I don't want to do that. So I'm going to stop asking this person for time until after finals, right? Because that's the end of the conversation. And typically there isn't more to it than that. If you tell a person what needs to be done, you're not telling them no. You're telling them that you have time that's already occupied. Right? And you're not telling them that you don't have time for them, so to speak. You're telling them that your time's already occupied. And if I go do this thing with you, I would love to do this thing with you. How can you help me get my time back? Right, So it becomes more of a reciprocity and a tit for tat kind of exchange rather than a no and we're closing off the door. So we're not necessarily letting someone down or disappointing someone. We're engaging the want to spend time or do the thing and also recognizing that we have obligations that have to be met. So when changing the perspective of answering this kind of a question and feeling like we're letting someone down, we can literally shift how we feel in an exchange about how time is spent and how we opt into time or don't. And over time, you'll stop getting many of these guilt trips and these asks for time when people know that you're actively a student. So hopefully that helps with just a bit of family guilt trip or spousal guilt trip or partner guilt trip or kiddo guilt trip. <laughs> You've seen that too. So hopefully that helps with that. The other thing I want to talk about is how we actually manage time. Let's see if I can get rid of this guy. So here, what we're talking about is getting everything done in limited amount of time. And that was something Jenna mentioned initially off the top today was how do we fit everything into actual chunked time, right? So when we think about that, we're looking for a total end goal. And that typically looks like a giant mountain, not something that's hikeable in a day. Maybe not something that's even like getting to the summit in like half a day. There are many, many parts that go into this. And if we just look at a due date, we hey. don't really conceptualize how we need to break things up. Was there someone in the participants that was talking? Okay, I just wanna make sure I didn't miss the question. Um, so when we think about just the due date, we don't break things apart. We don't think about how to plan into what goes into completing a task. So chunking is a really effective way to be mindful of what are the steps? What do I need to do first? What has to happen first? What do I probably wanna leave until last? And how much time is each of these pieces going to take? Once I figure out how many steps are in a thing, each step gets a calendar date. And the reason we actually plan out and write onto the calendar date each of these chunked steps is so that each one gets a day that can be moved. The reason that's useful is because life happens. And it's not a matter of if, but when life happens. Anything that can go wrong? Well, Murphy's Law is beautifully written that way. And the other part that we forget about is that not only will anything that can go wrong, go wrong, but also at the most inconvenient time, right? Think about when you got sick last and was it convenient when you got sick? Probably not, right? Some people argue there's no convenient time to be sick. Well, 
it doesn't make it any easier to renegotiate your schedule when things happen and happen at really inconvenient times. So what chunking helps you do is assign each little piece a calendar date so that maybe I can forgo the social thing that I really was looking forward to because I'm typically nose in a book as a student, but now I can replace it with something that needs to happen because I've gotten sick or I got a flat tire or my USB died or it went corrupt or a file was overwritten and I have to redo something or last second, get something else done. So it gives you space to negotiate before the due date is on your calendar, right? So it's not just the due date, it's all of the little pieces in between that go from start to actual finish. Now, one piece that's really helpful with this is actually just reading up on your assignments and your syllabus from word go. So we just started week two of our semester for 16 week classes. If you look at your syllabus now, is a good time to do that at the beginning of the semester. We actually read through all of the assignments at the, at the word go, top of the semester. What that does for us is now we have an idea of what goes into this assignment. Many times we see that due date that we were smart enough to put on our calendar approaching and we think to ourselves, okay, I still have a week to get that done. But in thinking to ourselves a week out that we still have a week to get that done, we still don't actually know what the steps are that go into that thing. We just know the due date is coming up. So we haven't actually read into it to know what kind of a mountain it actually is, how many steps go into that thing. So if we read up on what the mountain is at the beginning of the semester, that puts me in a great advantage because now I know how many chunks need to go on the calendar for that due date. So it's, not, it's no longer just the one thing on my calendar. Now I have something written in for maybe a couple of weeks ahead of that due date for all the small things that build up to that due date. So once I've gotten every major assignment for one course chunked and I have each step written into a calendar date, now I do that rinse, wash, repeat all over again for every class I'm enrolled in. My calendar fills up really quickly. And the good thing about that is that when you glance at your calendar with just due dates written in, even for multiple classes, you still look pretty unbusy, right? There's a due date on this Monday and then the next week on Thursday and then the next week on Monday and then the next week on like Wednesday. So you have like four things to do, that's cool. But when you actually chunk them and realize how many steps go into that thing and each of those due dates, your whole month fills up pretty quickly. That's more realistic. We should be doing something for each assignment every day, reading chapters, doing outlines, note cards, studying. That way we're not cramming right before a test. So test prep is another one of these, right? Each piece of curriculum that covered that's covered on a test gets its own calendar day. So I'm gonna actually review one and two in class. And then maybe by the time you do three and four in class, I'm reviewing one and two that next day. So that a few days before the test, I have time to go back over notes from one through like six or seven or eight, right? So depending on how many chapters you have on a test, each one of those pieces of textbook, like each chapter gets its own calendar day. So that you're actually going through all of these things and you have everything done by the time we get to test day. This is really, really helpful so that we can see as we're going, how we're making progress to a thing. And we actually end up finding less stress if we know we're making progress to a thing rather than getting right before a due date, two, three days ahead of time. Now we're unpacking the syllabus and going, oh, there are a whole lot of steps in this assignment. And now we're trying last minute to fit too many things into not enough time. And we don't earn grades that we know we could actually make had we mapped this out to begin with. So that regret sets in too. And every time we run into that regret, that emotion brings us down. And so then by halfway through the semester, about midterms, we've gotten regret so much that even by midterm, it's already impacting us. And we don't try as hard from midterms to finals because we're already disappointed that we didn't get to really demonstrate what kind of work we could have done had we planned better. Right? And that's not fun to recognize that it's not even about my capability. It's about how I planned or didn't know to plan or just didn't plan. Right, So if we can nip that in the bud, we're constantly building in confidence from beginning of semester to midterms that we use to roll downhill with from midterms to finals by doing everything in chunks rather than waiting until last minute to schedule. The other part of chunking 
is building in buffer time. No idea why that just happened. There we go. Buffer time is really centric on life happening. <laughs> so what we want to consider is building in buffer time helps us alleviate when life happens, right? So the idea with chunking is that we can put a chunk on a calendar date, life happens, and we can move that chunk to another calendar date and still hit deadline on time. That's buffer time, right? Building in buffer time so that if I move a deadline up from a Tuesday, Thursday class from Thursday to Tuesday, now my head is wrapped around getting that thing done by Tuesday. Well, what happens if I trick myself and go, oh, that's not actually doing until Thursday. Cool. Now the trick with not building a better idiot, I'm a better idiot. When I think of these things, I go back to my syllabus and I'm like, oh, <laughs> right. I tried to trick myself. That's not actually doing until Thursday. I stop looking at the syllabus. I move everything from the syllabus into my calendar. And from then on out, I don't go by the syllabus. I go by my calendar. So eventually amnesia kicks in and I forget what's in the syllabus because I'm only looking at my calendar. That's how you can prevent being a better idiot and not being able to trick yourself. So if I know now that I'm only looking at my calendar, by the time I get to that point in the semester, too many other things will have happened. I will have slept by then. And most likely I will remember it's due Tuesday. So that when life happens and it's not actually due until Thursday, I can still get it done. The reason that's important and valuable is because in a health sciences program, you are building your work reputation from application, not from your graduating semester. And if you're already in your graduating semester, this is even more important. So from word go, when I apply, if I've done everything correctly in the application, that gives an impression to my academic advisor who's reviewing your application. When I go and interact in student events, that gives an impression to Ms. Jana Weiss, your student life coordinator. And how you show up, right? How you take responsibility, how you take on responsibility and take on more things, how you manage your time. And when we start to look at these things from the instructor's view, they want to make sure that you can meet deadlines, that you're turning in your assignments on time. So when we actually take a look at this in brass tacks, like bare minimum, what's the essential thing I need to get across here? Buffer time helps you build your work reputation. If you have the world's best excuses for why you can never get your things done on time, that's what an instructor or a student life coordinator or a counselor or whoever is going to write about you when you go to ask them for a letter of recommendation for a job. That's the next piece that comes after education, right? You putting this thing to work, this little piece of paper that we've been killing ourselves to get, that guy's got to get us to a job. And what do we usually use? Letters of recommendation. But what do people have to write about you if your best skill set is coming up with great excuses why you didn't get the thing done, right? So the buffer time is really critical for supporting the work reputation that you'd like to build for yourself and showing people how to talk about you, right? Demonstrating things for others to write about you and to be excited about in recommending you. So that work reputation is really critical and it starts from where to go. As life happens, we are able to grind, right? So if I know that that assignment was due on Tuesday and I go back to my syllabus and I'm freaking out because I know it's not gonna happen. And I realize pleasantly surprised it's not due until Thursday. I have two more days to figure it out, right? And to get from A to B and get it done on time. With buffer time, the other piece that's really helpful is asking your instructors to just kind of be aware of something that's going on for you. So for instance, we figure out an assignment's due Tuesday, definitely not gonna get it done. We email the instructor, a little panicked. I recognize this isn't actually due until Thursday, but I also have to do these things in this other piece, right? This life happened piece. So I anticipate being able to get it done. I just wanna set the expectation that if it doesn't, if I miss that deadline, this is why. Doing that email or that conversation a couple of days before the deadline sets an expectation. Now, when you miss that deadline, the faculty at least have context for understanding why. That doesn't mean you're guaranteed to not get a point penalty or to get a zero for an assignment that's missed. But what it does mean is that when you ask for that letter of recommendation at the end of the semester, that's going to come back to mind so that you can be written, someone can write about you, that you're a great communicator and that you keep track of deadlines, that you know it was coming up and you recognize that you had a plan and life decided to mess with that plan, right? And play Tetris with your schedule. 
And as a result, you might miss a deadline. So now that person can write about you something valuable, very valuable in a professional setting. That if you know you're going to miss a deadline that you've been keeping track of, this is how I'm going to know about it rather than the alternative, which is missing the deadline and then having that email or conversation happen. Now it looks like an excuse rather than an expectation. Very different perceptions in how to respond to an excuse versus an expectation. So even if it doesn't buy you leeway to get an assignment submitted on time, it's still going to buy you work reputation maintenance. That's really important. So then we'll jump into a weekly breakdown of how we use time, less of how we perceive time and how we think about it. So this is a fun breakdown. I definitely encourage taking a screenshot or taking a picture of this screen because it's really, really helpful in figuring out um, how we spend time and how we dedicate it. This is just a breakdown of options for main kinds of things that we think about, right? Um, so this is between work, school, distractions, sleep, super critically important, please sleep, um, and how we spend time. Now, if we count up a weekly average for each of these categories, add them up, and then subtract them from the only 168 hours we get per week, we end up with maybe an average, and this is a national average, this is what these numbers are based on, of 11 hours per week left over. If we divide that by seven for seven days of the week, we get an hour and a half-ish per day left over. Now, if you think about it, school, distractions, work, and sleep, and distractions are all of the things we do that don't lend to productivity. So TV, streaming, social media, et cetera. If we do all of these and then figure out what we have left over, there's about an hour and a half. None of these categories include eating. Meals are pretty frequent, multiple times throughout the day, hopefully. Chores, being an adult, going grocery shopping, having food to consume, and grooming, right? Regular daily bathing. And that doesn't include if you are a parent, right? So work kind of includes parent time, but only the bare minimum of keeping your child or children alive. So we're talking about a morning routine, a PM routine to get them ready for bed the next day, dropping them off where they need to go for care and picking them up, right? This doesn't include having a relationship with your children, which is ideal, right? So even in the work category, we include some parenting, but not the meaningful kind. So if we think about what we have left over to do that doesn't readily fit in one of these categories, we need to really consider how we're spending time. So that's a really, really important kind of distinction. The other part, couple of pieces I wanna point out here is the formula on the first line for school. We want to spend three hours of study time outside of school for every one hour that you're enrolled. So if you took a three hour course, three hour lecture course, that's nine hours of study time added on top of the three hours you spend in class. So for every one hour enrolled, it's essentially a ratio for three hour class of 12 hours per three hour class. So if we're taking a 12 hour schedule, which is the minimum you need for full financial aid reimbursement, if you're using financial aid, that's a 48 hour a week commitment. It's 36 hours of study time, 12 hours of end class time. That's a 48 hour a week commitment. That's more technically than a full-time job. That's why they call it full-time. Now, three hours is equated to an A or a B grade for a course. So could you cut this ratio and do two hours out for every one hour in? Sure. That's technically the minimum, which will earn you a C grade. Now, if you short the actual ratio and then life happens and you don't get the opportunity to re-up to two hours out for every one hour in that particular week, there's a better likelihood that you're going to earn less than a C by the end of the semester especially since life likes to happen multiple times in a semester. It doesn't just happen once. So now we're flirting with maybe not passing because in a health sciences program, C is your minimum passing grade. So while a D grade is still gonna give you credit for financial aid, eligibility and SAP, you're gonna fail a course that's gonna push you back a semester at minimum. So more time and money. Ideally, what we wanna shoot for is that three hours out every one hour in of study time. So we want to be really strict with that ratio. If there's any line in here I want you to cut, it's distractions, obviously. But another one that students love to, to cut is sleep. Let me explain to you why sleep is non-negotiable. When you go to sleep and you hit REM, which is rapid eye movement, it's deep sleep. That's the time when your body resets. Everything resets. 
your endocrine system for immunity, your metabolism, your circadian rhythm, and anything that moves from memory happens during REM. So your short-term memory designed to hold 16 to 18 hours worth of information dumps into long-term memory during REM. So when you study a week later and need to recall it for a test, it's not coming out of short-term memory. It's coming out of long-term memory. That's where your recall is coming from. But if you don't sleep, nothing in your short-term memory gets dumped into long-term memory. Why are you a student, <laughs> right? Why study if you don't sleep? You have to sleep. That's where recall comes from on the test. This is exactly why pulling an all-nighter is a terrible, horrible, no good idea because you're only going to actually recall on the test that next morning or next afternoon, the most recent 16 to 18 hours worth of information. But if you've been studying for a full 24 to 30 hours ahead of that test, you're not gonna remember the first 12 to 14 hours of what you studied, it's gone. We can hook a person up to an EKG and actually watch the neural pathways that get impressed, egress. Literally, they just vanish, the information's gone. So you have to, have to, have to sleep. It takes two REM cycles a night to actually fully convert short-term to long-term memory. Each REM cycle takes two to four hours to cycle through. On the long end, that's eight hours of sleep per night. If you happen to sleep faster and you feel rested after a six-hour night of sleep, that's the bare minimum that I would recommend per night. And that's to make sure you're keeping everything you get from short-term to long-term memory. So be really mindful about sleep. That's why at minimum, I've put six up here as a national average. National average is actually unfortunately less than that, but six at minimum. So use this template, wildly misinterpret all the category names, be realistic for what's true for your life and see what you have left over per day after all of these categories. Make sure you're actually putting everything in there that needs to be there. If school doesn't fit at a full-time status, maybe consider taking fewer classes rather than reducing the number of study time that you're putting in for every hour you spend in class. And if you don't have a part-time opportunity, maybe consider putting off school until you have more support or building in more support now before we get too far into the semester. There's always options. But if you need help figuring out how to make this work, let me know. Send me an email. We can absolutely sit down and do this and make sure we're getting you connected to resources who can help give you time back. So the last little bit that I'll scream through really quickly, most of you have been through an orientation with us. Um, so you've actually seen these slides generally before. Um, the resources that you have available to you, at least on campus counseling, are things like personal counseling, educational counseling, community referrals, um, the SQ4R reading method, which is a great tool if you happen to be neurodivergent. If you have any kind of neurodiversity, um, either autism and any kind of scale, ADHD, um, dyslexia, reading disabilities, anything like that, SQ4R reading method is a wonderful tool. Um, and it also helps neurotypical learners too, especially with critical thinking curriculum, which all of you are doing in health sciences and also crisis intervention. Um, and the ability services piece of that is making sure that we're putting accommodations into place if neurodivergence or any other kind of restriction on your range of ability exists for you. So that is generally it. I am always here and um, the counselor is in. I love peanuts, it's great. Snoopy is wonderful. Um, so if you have any questions or you'd like to connect with me, I'm happy to do that. You can send me an email to the email address on the screen um, and just make sure you give me that nine digit student ID number so that we can jump in. Any questions you can direct to the chat or send me an email and I'll be happy to help. Thank you so much to you all for spending a little time with me today. I hope this helps. Thank you, Brandy. Does anybody have any questions for her? Okay. Well, I would like to take an opportunity to inter introduce myself, Brandy. Thank you so much. The information that you welcome. provided is so valuable, and um, and it's always a pleasure listening to this particular. Uh, webinar I, I get something out of it every time Yay, especially yeah, the part right. about they know <laughs> I know it speaks but, to a lot um, of people it does and I have a very similar mom <laughs> but 
I'm sure many of our students can also relate, but my name is Amanda, Amanda Guerrero. I'm the director for instructional support with Houston Community College. And that's really just a fancy way of saying that I oversee the tutoring activities for the college, uh, specifically to our academic success centers. So I wanted to uh, share a little bit of brief information with you since we do have a couple more minutes uh, yet, and it's pertaining to the tutoring resources that you have. So in addition to um, in addition to counseling services and the library, I'm not sure if you guys are aware, but HCC does offer uh, complimentary tutoring to our students. And, um, oh golly, there we go. Um, complimentary in, our, in both um, in person as well as um, our virtual academic success center. So there are three different options that our students have uh, to receive tutoring. Option one is a video conference tutoring, which is done through Microsoft Teams. And it's really simple. We've tried our best to just simplify this information for our students. Um, you really just need to call 713-718-8184. And our lab assistants can assist with setting up uh, your tutoring session, getting you connected to Microsoft Teams, all that good jazz. Now we are open on Monday and Thursday from eight in the morning till eight at night. So we do take our last appointments at seven. We're also open on Tuesdays and Wednesdays from eight until 10 p.m. And then Fridays, eight to four, Saturdays, nine to three. Um, if I give you any bit of information that you walk away with, I would hope that you pull your cell phones out right now and program in 713-718-8184, label it tutoring. That way, if you either lose the link to this particular uh, webinar or um, your notes or whatever have you, at least you'll have that telephone number saved into your phone. So when you do need help, you can call in and get that. Uh, we also offer one-on-one -on -one tutoring at 14 of our academic success centers. It's the same telephone number to schedule an appointment. You are able to stop by, but it is best to schedule an appointment. That way um, you're not waiting. And if you are at a center where maybe a specific topic is not offered, you can still hop onto one of our computers where we have the uh, webcams and video conference and with a tutor that might be working at another center. Now, option three is for asynchronous tutoring. Asynchronous means it's not real time like this. Um, you would submit an assignment or a paper and then wait for a faculty tutor to get back to you on that. And that's through Upswing. They are linked on our website as well as on our Find a Tutor uh, site. And what that will do is um, it's really great for, say, busy working individuals who may not be available at the times when... Uh, we do have our, our academic success centers open. And also if you do have a, a, a paper that you want a faculty tutor to look through and provide comments throughout. Uh, we advise our students to come and get help early and frequently in the semester because they tend to have higher success rates than those who wait until the last minute. It's also a best practice to come prepared, um, meaning you don't have a quiz or a test say that particular day, but you're planning in advance because that's not exactly fair to the tutor to put that kind of pressure and stress on them because we've procrastinated. So I just wanna make that as a kind note for everybody in, um, in the call today. And outside of that, um, provided to you that information, uh, we could talk a little bit about what tutors do and don't do. So our, our tutors are there um, to support with problem solving and to help you become better writers and readers. But our writing tutors are not editors. Um, they won't grade your work and they won't provide you ideas about what to write, uh, but they will help you look through your paper see if there are some patterns um, uh, that need to be worked on. Let's say, you know, writing a thesis statement or organizing your paper or maybe using comma slices incorrectly, whatever have you. And then they help you to uh, work to correct those particular areas as well as just overall um, readability of your paper, um, your thought process, how you're organizing it, all that good stuff. Our math and science tutors, they will help you become aware of where you went sideways on a particular problem. If they see, um, a graded uh, problem, they might remix it and come up with a similar type problem and help you work through solving that. So then you can turn around and solve the paper that, or the actual problem that's gonna be graded 
uh, and it's your work that's being submitted, not the tutor's work. So that's very important to understand what we can and can't do. And that's really so that we're upholding the utmost with academic integrity. Um, these are all the different ways that you can reach us. The Find a Tutor link is wonderful if you're looking for schedules. Um, our students have really great feedback. Um, this is a lot of feedback too. It's over 1,200 responses that we got. And outside of that, are there any questions for the Academic Success Center, tutoring in general, what, we, what we're here to do to help support you? I'm not seeing any questions. Please check the chat. The flyer that she showed you is posted in the chat. And um, then if you want to see more upcoming events, we posted the link to see all upcoming events. And then um, also a survey if you'd like to fill that out for us and let us know how we're doing. And then we have bingo tonight at 6 p.m. on Zoom, $25 gift cards for winners. So thank you for coming today. Thank you, Brandy. Thank you, Amanda. Um, thank you for sharing this great information. We will be posting this on the Tutor website, this recording on the tutoring website and on um, our Student Life YouTube page. Thank you, everybody. Jenna, I want to jump in real quick. There was yeah. an email or there was a chat that was sent to me directly that I want to address to everyone oh, real quick. Yeah. If you want to be able to get this content, if you arrived late or jumped in like very last minute, um, feel free to send me an email to the email address that I'm about to drop into the chat um, and just include your nine digit student ID number. I'm happy to go over this stuff with you all one on one. Like, feel free to send me an email if you want to catch the material and you can just tell me that you missed the balancing act event um, or like missed some of it or you were late, whatever the case is, and you want to go back through that. I'm happy to schedule an appointment to do that with you one on one. So just send me an email to the email address I just dropped in the chat and I will be happy to schedule that with you. Good deal. Thank you, Brandy. For sure. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Have a great week. Have a great week.